the Appalachians. Underneath these beautiful and pristine mountains lies one of the nation's leading sources of energy, coal. In the heart of eastern Kentucky sits the town of Hyden, a coal town. There, on December 30th of 1970, 39 men went underground into the Finley coal mine. Only one man came out alive. This is their story. I'm George Wooten. Uh, I live here in Lacey County, it's Hyden, Kentucky. I lived here practically all my life. Uh, I know the county pretty well. We have 263,000 acres of land. And at one time, around 97% of Leslie County was forest land. And then later in the 40s, they began coal operations here at the, during the uh, World War II. And all the mining companies were small mines where they worked uh, just to pick and shovel men. And they drilled and shot their own coal with a, with a, a big auger. And they did the, all the explosives and everything was, was from powder in the earlier days. But as the mechanical age uh, <clears throat> increased and different discoveries come along, well, they got better methods of mining. So... During the 40s and 50s, there were several small mining operations in Leslie County. And one was, in particular, was the Finley Coal Company on Hurricane. And the coal was very small, around 28 to 30 inches, the coal seam was. And they worked around, I guess, 30 or 40 men in this mine. They worked two shifts. And one cold, bleak winter day in 1970, around 3.30 in the afternoon, I was coming from my farm from Camp Creek down to the mouth of Hurricane, and I heard a, a terrible explosion, and I thought to myself, this is where we'd been drilling a rock to widen the road going up hur Hurricane to the mines. We'd furnished the Finley boys an air compressor to drill and shoot a big rock just up in Hurricane there. And the hole is still in this rock. But instead of the explosion from this rock, it was the explosion of the mines. So I walked on up back up the Hurricane Creek. And when I went up there, why well, I found out that the mine had exploded. And there's only one man on the outside of the mines. I believe his name was Collins. And he <clears throat> he had evidently walked out of the mines because they'd changed shifts. The 330s, the other shift was going on. And he was at the, at the drift mouth there, and the mines had blown timbers all out, and rock dust was all over. And the big thing then, we knew the mines had, bl had blown up. So we we called the, uh, the official capacity, the law enforcement, the rescue squads, the hospital, the Frontier Nursing Service, Dr. Beasley was her doctor then. And they set up uh, the, the station there around the mine, so if, maybe if someone uh, was leaving, when they finally could go in the mine and start bringing them out, they were set up ready to take care of them. Dwayne Walker was one of the first men called to the scene. My father, Dwayne Walker, he uh, he owned the funeral home. He and my mom, Jean, at the time. And besides the funeral home, he was the coroner, which was brought into play for the uh, disaster. And also at that time, in 1970, we ran the uh, local ambulance service. So there was uh, 
as a coroner in the ambulance service too, he was involved. And, and I think first of all, really was contacted as, as to uh, bring the uh, ambulances up. And as I said, uh, we'd heard rumors that there had been an explosion and he contacted, of course, the uh, other local resources that we had here, whether it be coal mines or, or uh, fire departments, and then other local in a neighboring county, so the response with that. And then when they arrived, it was, uh, you had to wait and see, you know, while they were doing the investigation. And uh, there was the question of, of uh, with the gas and dust, if it was still safe to enter. And if I'm not mistaken, they waited. Mr. Walker drafted men from the community to assist him in his duties. Okay, I'm Tom Sizemore, superintendent of Leslie County Schools. Uh, I became involved in the hurricane mine disaster. Uh, Dwayne Walker, our coroner, came and asked me would I assist him in, in that we'd had a disaster at the Finley Mine. It became known. I got a friend of mine, Richard Boland, former superintendent of Leslie County, who is now presently deceased, and uh, asked him would he assist with that. And we rode over to the mine site with Dwayne Walker, and we were there, and we were there when they brought out the first victims. And uh, they loaded the bodies up in the hearse, and we were told that they were gonna set up a temporary morgue at the Leslie County High School Gymnasium. And uh, we stayed here, and our role was to help identify bodies and uh, assist with anything Dwayne asked us to do. And for me personally, that was a very traumatic experience. I had never seen a dead person other than after the funeral director had done their things and the person was in a coffin. So that was a, a, a real stressful time for me during that time and after. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a difficult situation. We stayed there all night. And I recall that uh, they had security on the door so people, the news media couldn't get in. And uh, as family members came in, Dwayne would take them to help make positive identification of the bodies. That was especially difficult because uh, I knew most all of those people. And uh, then we were directed to uh, tag those bodies for wherever they were to go, what funeral home the family wanted to be in charge of those arrangements. And we stayed there till the next morning. This disaster shook the community to its very core. Here, R.B. Campbell recalls what it was like in Hyden following the explosion. Well, it probably was the worst disaster we've had in the history of the county, including before and after, all these years after it. We've never had a mine disaster that even approached the magnitude of this one. And it affected so many people in the counties, uh, and, and, and the two or three counties around us even, that had people relatives that were killed in it. <clears throat> and uh, as far as I can recall, no one escaped that was in the mine. I think everyone that was in there was killed. And again, I may be wrong. Uh, <clears throat> it was several days and weeks and months. It was about all you heard on the streets. Everybody wanted to talk about the mine disaster. And everyone did have a cousin or a, or a close relative that was affected by the disaster. Very few people escaped because of the magnitude of the number of people that were involved and uh, anybody, everybody on the street was kind of talked in a low voice and it was just a terrible tragedy. Rufus Fugit has lived and worked in Leslie County for many years. He recalls his experiences on the day of the accident. 
Gabriel Beasley and Murray Elam and I were on Tower Mountain Mining uh, on, up at Asher Branch looking for fossils and we heard the boom from up there. And when I got home, I couldn't get to my house. The highway, the ditch lines, everything was lined with cars. Uh, family members and curiosity people. Uh, and they blocked the road off going down to Hurricane, down to the mine because they, uh, they only let uh, people who live down there, residents, go down. And uh, I think they may have let some relatives of the uh, miners that were killed go down. But they had to limit the traffic down through there because of the narrow road. So they were parked all the way. I couldn't, I came home and couldn't get up in the driveway because they had it full of cars. <laughs> so that's the thing that stuck in my mind more than anything. But it was a, it was a tragic thing that uh, I think put the people in the whole county in shock for a period of time and disbelief. <coughs> And some of the things happened down to mine were interesting. The descriptions they gave of how the the man in the, at the mouth of the mine near near where the fan was that forced air back in the mine was blown out of the mine. Don't remember his name. He wasn't killed, but he was there in the just up here in a short distance. That was uh, got my attention. But generally, uh, it was just a tragic event that we couldn't believe uh, anything like that would happen around here. <clears throat> but it did, and uh, it took a lot of lives of good, hard-working people and affected an awful lot of families. Actually, it affected the whole county. One family hit especially hard was the Couch family. Daisy Eastep lost both her husband and brother-in-law that day. It was time to start getting the things, you know, ready to I was a washing and stuff, so I started to wash, and I didn't have no washing powder, so they're in the store up here. And I walked over there, and Audrey said, did you know that uh, a man's broke up there where Houghton Haird, that was his twin brother, where Houghton Haird were blowed up. I said, no, I ain't heard nothing about it. And uh, there was a number A, you know, I mean a section A and stuff like that. Well, I thought that was different mines. Well, my neighbor, Yvonne, and them had hurt Yvonne Couch and her boy, now he's my son-in-law, uh, stopped. When I started walking back, they stopped, and they told me. So I just went on. Mom was with the kids, and, uh, and it was awful. It was awful. They were still like smoke and stuff, you know, coming out of the mines. But in my heart, I never did believe that Harold was dead. I couldn't. And, uh, you know, at that time, I thought, you know, they'd move all that stuff and just bring them out. You know, I didn't. And uh, we stayed till it started snowing. And, uh, my family wanted me to come back. They said, when they get him out, said they'll let us know. I went out months. And uh, my neighbors down here, Carlos Couch and Erlene, they come out. Well, it was in the night, long, you know, when I come out. And uh, they said that uh, they's hair's dead. I said, they found my world ended. Then the state police from the highway patrol, <clears throat> they blocked the roads on each end at the mouth of the hurricane. They only have it one way in, one way out. So they blocked the roads at the upper end of the hurricane and lower end in order to prevent uh, blockage in case they need to, you know, take a, somebody out of the mines. So it was real, real bad, bad weather. And as the family began to come in from Clay County, most of the boys was killed was from, was from Clay County. Uh, but several of our Leslie County boys, and it's all from young men to middle-aged men. There were very few elderly men worked in the mines then. Uh, but the Finleys had the name of running a good mine. Uh, they run a lot of coal, 
and it was a high quality coal. Uh, but then after they got all the uh, emergency services set up and everything, of course they had to take all that evening and all night uh, before they get the rescue squads coming in from different areas of the state, coming in to try to rescue and go into the mines. They had to get air back in the mines. They had to set up air, and they had no communication system there, so the Leslie County Telephone System, they run a line from the mines down to the mouth of the hurricane there at Wendover to tie in so they could get the proper communications in and out of there. But it was a terrible time, and it's a, it's a, people was from all over was uh, really hoping that there'd be someone could be living in the mines. But I, to my opinion, when the explosion went off, to my opinion, there was nobody could live or was living a half a second after the explosion. It'd be just like laying a case of dynamite on a rock and the fish under that rock, and when that explosion went off, the concussion, to my opinion, killed every man in the mines. Uh, that was a... They had drilled the, the, the drill and, sh and shooting man, I believe it was Mr. Bentley, I believe he was in charge. He was a good, good shot for me. But anyway, he'd evidently drilled uh, several holes up over into the mines to make room to put a, a walkway over top of the, over top of the belt line. And of course, when he, he evidently had the, a lot of other explosives on his little man trip, a little car. And probably, I don't know for sure, but according to the proof, after the mine inspectors checked everything out, according to the proof that they was evidently using primal cord to touch off these explosions, explosives. Uh, we used primal cord during the war to tie around trees to blow trees down. You'd wrap a roll of primal cord around the tree and touch it off and it'd cut it off to like a chainsaw. Uh, and they, they were very, uh, very explosive and real, real fast. So the people began to come in. Then the, the uh, all night long. The next day, then after the next day, it began to clear up. The people then there were proper equipment, and they began to put get the air going into the mines. And the mine inspectors was the first crew uh, that would go in with. The, the, the federal uh, rescue squads and everything. Uh, they'd go part of the way in and they'd send another crew in and come in and go in and come in. And finally, they got into where all the mine men were. And one by one, and during that time, though, they'd set up the gym over here at the school. They'd set it up for the, uh, to bring all the men in as they found them and they laid them out over there in, in the gym. The explosion. I've never been around any, uh, an explosion of that magnitude, and uh, of course, some of the miners were recognizable. Those that were closest to the explosion, uh, it, it was hard to uh, to recognize, other than from identification that they had on or dental records were used. Uh, it was just a, it was a uh, very powerful explosion. And uh, I know the way the ID, if there was any question, they tried to bring family in to view those that they thought could be viewed and identified. And then if, if that wasn't possible, they used, uh, if it was an article of clothing, if it was a personal item, cigarettes, a brand of tobacco, a pocket knife, a watch, like that, I remember we used the more, I mean, the, the gym more for just as a place, a central sort of uh, control center as a place that we could, uh, you know, could tag the bodies. And then when they released to, uh, for the funeral homes or whatever to, to uh, send out. And um, it was really the only building at the time that was large enough. The hospital, as you said, was on the hill and we didn't, there's no National Guard arm or anything, so the school board was gracious that they, they agreed to, to do that, to use the gym. 
But yeah, I, I was down there even as a freshman in high school trying to help. We will never know exactly what happened in the Finley Mine that day. Clarence Engel, however, knows exactly what can happen inside the mountains. Mr. Engel has survived several mining accidents, and here he recalls one such experience. Well, you'd have to be real careful about, especially if, if you worked in a place where somebody else had worked before, and oh, like old mines, and you cut into that and have plenty of water in there, it floods you out, and you'd be in danger of drowning. And then, uh, well, like you said, about, I was talking about dust and rib rolls and things like that. Uh, if you don't keep your coal dust shoveled up and loaded out and cleaned out there and then rock dust put down in this place, uh, you, you're in danger of having an uh, explosion there. You could catch, well, one spark could set it off, I guess, and cause an explosion. 